actually the nomad laboratory comes with many different facets and they have actually chosen a few aspects that I'm going to share with you. And in particular, I'd like to start with the big picture, which is that at some point, maybe not in a year or two, but at some point we really would like to come up with maps that tell us where in the computational and uh, compositional and um, configurational space we find materials that are suitable for a certain purpose. For instance, um, where can I find superconductors, where can I find transparent materials and things like that. And of course, pre requisite for this having a lot of data. Uh, the question will be, of course, how multidimensional these maps will be. It will certainly not be a two-dimensional map, but at a certain point I think it should be possible. Now we have a role model for this, and this role model is the periodic table of elements. It's actually a two-dimensional representation and it was really genius, I think about it, Mendeleev came up with this at a time where quantum mechanics was not in place. So just looking at the properties of the atoms, he arranged it in a way uh, such that it still gives us a, quite a bit of our full understanding of chemistry and physics of today. So this is a two-dimensional thing and looking at materials, I think, uh, everything will be much more complicated, it will be highly dimensional, but at some point I think it should be possible. So let me give you one example. It's the simplest example we came up with a few years ago. It was the first paper that we published in this respect. It's about a very simple and well-known problem, the so-called Philips van Fechten problem. So given I have two atoms, A and B, what kind of crystal structure would they form? And um, would this be zinc blender or would it be rock salt? So in this case, it would be a two-dimensional uh, map somehow telling us whether D1 or D, uh, uh, as a function of D1 or D2, where in this map I could find one or the other um, crystal structure. Now the solution of thank you. I show you the solution of this problem uh, that we actually obtained with a comps compressed sensing algorithm, so a method of statistical learning or artificial intelligence, if you like. And this is just a two-dimensional um, uh, description of the whole thing. So what you show, see here in, in the color code is that everything what is blue is in, this is the total energy difference, is in favor of zinc blender, uh, rock salt, whatever is in red, the total energy difference is in favor of the zinc blender structure and everything what is green, the total energy difference is so small that you hardly can distinguish. So you see here from a two-dimensional description already that we get a separation of these two structures just, and this is very important, by using uh, properties of the elements A and B. So we didn't use any property of the, of the compounds of these materials. Now, uh, I'm not going to, to in more detail here because in lack of time, but if you really want to uh, play with this, you can go to the Nomad Analytics Toolkit and you can try yourself. You can try all possible descriptors and then you find if you get the same solution than we got. So, in order to actually achieve our goal of drawing these materials maps, I think, what is the prerequisite? As I said, we need a lot of data. In particular, we need fair data. And so I picked actually the aspects that I want to discuss with you in terms of these four, uh, four uh, letters, FAIR, which means findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So the FAIR principles, I think there was a paper coming out in 2016 by Mark Wilkinson, uh, which somehow formally described what FAIR means. Uh, we had actually implemented all these principles in, in spirit in the NOMAD repository, which went online already in 2014. So what does it mean? Uh, and I start with this F, means findable, and I think I don't need to mu spend much time on it because every one of, of you has experienced the situation that the student finishes the PhD or whatever, and then these people leave and they leave their data somewhere on some computers, and two years after you're asking the question, uh, where are these data? So I think since we have the NOMAD repository, I'm pretty relaxed because I know that everything is in place and we have got much more organized. So it's not only sharing data, but it's also an advantage for ourselves to, to, to get organized. Now still, you may ask the question whether these data are accessible. They are in fact accessible for the experts in the sense that 
Now if you look into the database, uh, we have a closer look, this is all sitting in files. So we collect all the full input and output files and uh, you can download these files by APIs uh, or the other services. But the question is, can we make it more human accessible? And in order to do so, we have created uh, another service, which is the Nomad Encyclopedia. So in this graphical user interface, it's a search engine actually, you can select the material according to its composition, for instance, or according to structure or properties or the method that has been used to create it. Then you get a list of materials that fulfill this criteria. And if you choose one of these materials from the list, then uh, the encyclopedia shows you what we know in terms of structure, band structure, or also a phonon properties, thermal properties. So whatever people have computed all over the world with whatever method, uh, the encyclopedia is supposed to show you the results. And this way you can also compare different results. And even if this looks like just a mere, mere survey, actually like this, it's like a picture book of materials, but I think it's very useful and it also can give you some insight from, from a scientific perspective. So a question we were asking, for instance, was, um, can we find, given we have a material, can we find a similar material? So just think about the problem that many materials are toxic. Our, I don't know, our beloved uh, perovskites, the like perovskites, they all contain lead, lead. Can we find something with the same electronic properties like these materials, but without lead, without any toxic element? Now I'm not going to show you halide perovskites because we don't have yet this amount of materials. But I'll show you something similar, okay? So uh, we implemented fingerprints, uh, which tells you or gives you material with the most similar to the one that you have chosen in terms of the de uh, density of states. So this is the um, example of gallium arsenide. This is the reference system, and now I'm asking which of the materials I can find. So gallium phosphide is something which is very similar to this. The next would be whatever you find. So for each and every material that you have in the encyclopedia, and we have densities of states of we show the most, the five most similar materials uh, that we can that we can find in the in the database, and this is actually based on a search among 280,000 materials that have been downloaded through the Encyclopedia API. So let me move on, uh, going to the I. I means interoperable, and this is actually a very big question because we have more than 50 million calculations now in the Encyclopedia, uh, not in the Encyclopedia, but in the in the Nomad archive. And if you really want to search among materials, you have to ask the question whether you can operate on the whole material space if these data come from different sources. And this is actually gives you a snapshot of the calculations that we have inside. As have been pointed out yesterday by Chauffroy, most of these calculations, or a majority of the calculation comes from us, also owing to the fact that we have a flow lab and materials project and OPMD incorporated into the database. But there are many, many other codes, and in fact, we support 40 different codes that are widely used by the community. So, in other words, the raw data is nice to have, but we want to go further, and this way, now we have, what we have in the Nomad archive is the same data, but brought into a normalized uh, uh, format, now having the same file format, but also the same units. Okay? So for doing this, normalizing this, we didn't want to put the burden on the code developers because they should do science with, uh, with, with the code, but this is what we, sub, um, we developed actually. And this was a set of metadata and also parsers that did this job. So very important, the metadata here um, is not only the, uh, the generic metadata, what in total energy is or a lattice constant and things like that, but also all the metadata that are specific to the code. In other words, we wouldn't understand otherwise what the meaning of a VASP total energy is and that of a FHIM's total energy. And so otherwise you cannot normalize this. So now we have 40 parses in, in place which actually do the job for us. So still, you may ask the question, I go back here, uh, whether you can operate on all this data at the same time and if you compare this data at the same time. Because if you just think about the delta test, where everything has been performed for fully converged basis sets, in daily life this is not the case. So the data that we have in here are very heterogeneous. And if you want to compare them, we need to make sure that we can compare them, right? 
So uh, for this we actually went ahead and we created many, many data on purpose. So we used four different codes and we analyzed the error that comes with the basis set size. So I don't go into detail what's, what these numbers or with these figures down here means, but whenever you go from the left to the right, it means that you increase your basis set size and you're getting better and better. And there you see how the total energies change as a function of basis set size. So and all of them go down to basically the same precision once they're fully converged. So the question we were asking is now, this we did actually for the 71 elemental solids that are included in the delta test. The question was, can we learn from these errors uh, how the errors behave in much more compli uh, complex structures? So we went ahead and did something very, very simple, namely saying, okay, we know the errors from the, uh, from the elements, from these 71 uh, samples here, but then we can predict the error of any complex alloy by just summing up the errors that we have from the, from, from the elements. And this is the answer. Now, what we got for, um, for binary materials, so these are 63 binary materials, but we also have ternary materials and selected others. And, um, so, let me zoom in into, into one of them, exciting in order to tell what you, what you see uh, in, in a minute here. So, this is the estimated error on the y-axis compared to the calculated error. And if everything was perfect, of course it should, I don't know what's happening here, but it should, should lie on a straight line. Right? So you see, it's somehow following the line. Of course, it's not perfect because it's a very, very simple linear combination of these errors here and somehow the bonding of these different materials is different. But what is nice to see here is, if you do a calculation or do the calculation for the simple materials, then you get with, let's say, a lousy prediction or with a precision or not a very high precision, then you also can estimate the errors in the same order of magnitude. But if you do the calculation with a higher precision, which is given by the red cloud here, then the error also of the predicted material goes tremendously down. So in other words, the calculation you can do for the very simple materials, you can converge to this and then you have a prediction for the complex material, which is, has a very, very small error at the end. So finally, this is just the beginning of these investigations, but finally this gives us somehow a good, good handle on how we can handle the, the situation in the future such that we can operate on the whole data space of the whole uh, materials database. So at the end, let me just come to the R, which is the reusability. Uh, of course, you know there's materials that you can use for different purposes. So if I run a calculation for titanium dioxide, then mostly because I'm interested in spectroscopy, I like to learn about the method that I'm using with other people working on catalysis, on solar cells, or on sunscreens, or whatever. So they can use exactly the same data and use them for a completely different purpose. So that's why we call it more repurposable than reusable. So reusable sounds like a bit like second hand, right? So now, um, but think about that in average, we publish in a paper a number or a table or a figure, something like this. We never publish the full information that we have obtained by running a DFT calculation or something uh, beyond DFT. So we always solve the full quantum mechanical problem, but we only publish a small fraction of this. And I think in that sense, sharing the data in order to make other people use it or allow other people to use it, I think is a, is a good thing because sharing enables somehow new insights by different aspects or by different, uh, different approaches. So my time is nearly up. I have one more minute to talk about the next steps where we are going. Uh, NOMAD actually started as a bilateral project, as a common database. It somehow evolved into a European-wide and even worldwide uh, initiative. And now NOMAD somehow is hosted by um, an association, uh, which is Fair Data Infrastructure for Physics, Chemistry, Material Science and Astronomy. As you see here, computational material science, particular NOMAD, is part of this. And we're also expanding towards soft matter, experimental science, catalysis, and other topics uh, like this. And I also like to mention that NOMAD is an implementation network of the GoFair initiative of the European uh, Open Science Cloud. Uh, 
So I'm looking for two postdocs, if I'm allowed to <laughs> have this advertisement here. And finally, it's zero minutes. I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>